live. This wasn't supposed to happen, but alas, here we are. Welcome to a brand new edition of Off the Cuff on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network on the YouTube page. This is going to go on all the podcasting platforms as well, so you may be listening there, but uh, thanks for joining us. If you're going to be watching, my name is Mike Keck. Hope you're all having a great week so far. This week on the show, the panel is cut in half. Kyle Steele needed the night off. Craig Allen had church league playoff hockey, so like the song says... <laughs> It's just the two of us tonight. Joining me as always, Mr. Reliable himself, the one, the only, Drake Riggs. How are you, sir? Fantastic, Mike. You know, it fours a crowd anyway, so it's going to be better this way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look forward to it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. If you guys got questions, fire them away. We're going to, uh, like, like I told Drake before we hit record, we're just flying from uh, up th- from the seat of our pants right now. I don't really have a lot prepared. Uh, I do have some email questions I can pull up, but... We're just going to kind of shoot the breeze and you guys can dictate this conversation wherever it goes as you guys are jumping on. Uh, so let's get into this thing, Drake. First off, people are still talking about the main event of UFC Auckland. There's still a lot of people torn on who they thought won the fight between Dan Hooker and Paul Felder. Of course, two of the judges scored it for Dan Hooker. It was a great fight. What did you think? How did you score it? So I gave Hooker the first two rounds and then Felder uh, three and four. And then the fifth round to Hooker because of that late takedown, which um, I feel like might not have been. I have to. I haven't watched it, you know, since the first time. But you know, looking back on it, I'm like, okay, how much did he really score with it? You know, he had the full minute of control. Uh, didn't do a whole lot of damage though. Um, he got some transitions. I remember he got in. I think he got into full mount like right before the bell sounded. Right. So I mean, it's like how much it was weighed there because that's obviously i think that came down to it for a lot of people i guess well obviously what came down to it for me because i think felder was just edging it man the whole fight was so insanely close you know like every single round i saw it scores pretty pretty much all over the place like some people thought felder won the first two uh and then you know hooker with like the opposite of mine i was like okay i mean i, I get it it was that close and that competitive so um no robbery or anything like we always got to mention that but people because people will say and have said you know felder should have won they're like yeah sure yeah maybe he should have but he wasn't robbed you know did you see like both of those guys were so beat up after that fight it's just like it was insane like it was what we expected i think it just wasn't as it was it was a lot cleaner it wasn't like a wild sloppy fight it was so good though man that was uh that was phenomenal. You can't be mad at the result there. I mean, if it was a draw, I would have been probably most happy, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I agree it's like, it's like Bigfoot uh, Mark Hunt won, you know, like that kind of fight. <laughs> I, I said this on Between the Links last night, and I've said it throughout the recap as well. I scored it for Felder, but I had mad at you if you scored it for Dan Hooker. I thought Hooker looked great in the first round. Felder picked it up a little more in the second. I thought Hooker got the third. And Felder, I thought his the fourth round was his best round. And I thought... In the fifth, Felder landed the more effective shots, and he did more damage mm-hmm. in that final round. Yeah, and I, I understand, you know, Hooker getting the takedown, how you maybe score that, but I didn't think he did very much with it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a judge, and like Dana White says, who gives a shit what we think? We're not judges. But what's interesting is we have seen a lot of these close decisions so far in 2020, and people are yeah. just up in arms about it. We're screaming robbery left and right. You know, let's change how we score fights. Let's do open scoring. Let's do half points. And to me, these kinds of fights, this is these are the kind of fights we wanted for the sport for a long time. Like, we wanted the best guys to fight the best guys. We wanted the headliners to deliver. And the game has changed over the years. Like, fighters are evolving. The cream of the crop is rising to the top for a reason. Because of that, we're going to see a lot more of this stuff. We're going to see a lot more of these kinds of fights. Yes, it sucks when your your favorite fighter loses a really close decision. And don't get me started on the pay structure. That's that's another podcast on the road. But for entertainment purposes, don't we want highly competitive fights like these, Drake? Like, isn't this isn't this what we hoped for when Hooker and Felder and Jones and Reyes were booked? No, exactly, man. You are one hundred percent right. It's it's so funny to me, you know, I I because when. I think about defining like a good fight, you know, it's always a competitive one in my opinion. Like if we go back to, here's a good example. I look at uh, Gilbert Melendez and Diego Sanchez, right? I don't think that that was a good fight definition wise because it wasn't very competitive. We know that Gilbert obviously was winning that fight. Yeah. It was very entertaining because it was, you know, so crazy. And, you know, Diego was being Diego and his, you know, <laughs> most Diego-ness, <laughs> but competitively, <laughs> it wasn't really a good fight. Like uh, there's other examples of that one. Most Diego fights, I guess would probably be a good example of that. Um, so yeah, no, this is like the highest level kind of fight that you want, you know, and it's what we're going to get as the sport continues, continues to progress. Cause 
this sport, I still think people forget how young it really is. Like, what, like 26 years now? I mean, man, think about like the NFL is they just had their 100th season. You know, <laughs> like that's this is a quarter of what that is. So there is still so much more to be seen. It's only going to be so much better. And if you think about how quickly the sport has progressed too, when you look at like the NFL, for example, there, I know not really a good example, but if you want to look at it, you go from like the fifties and the sixties, like those days to then it's like, man, it, it's, you, it's really uncomparable. And if you think about it changing that much, that's an absolutely mind blowing thought. I don't know if it's going to be that crazy of a, you know, jump in talent and all that, but it's exciting to imagine it. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy watching like six foot nine, 375 pound linemen running four, eight forties. Like that is yeah. frightening. <laughs> that is exactly. absolutely frightening. Um, and I feel like the sports is going to get better and better. I'm, I'm really looking forward to like this next generation because, you know, six, seven, eight year old kids when I was growing up, I mean, it was t-ball and soccer and basketball and things like that and it was like that probably in the 90s and the early 2000s as well now you get kids i have a niece who's like nine years old taking jujitsu classes right now i'm like this is this is crazy (laughs) like these people like there are kids who are coming up right now like i interviewed this amateur fighter isaac moreno he's been doing martial arts since he was three years old and he's killing these amateur fighters in houston like we're gonna the next generation of fighters we're gonna see in the next 10 15 years like these are the kinds of fighters we're going to see. It is nuts to think about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. It's, it's definitely, that's just the thing with the progression, you know, as, as the sport gets more known and um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for more accepted, I guess, you know, because back in the day people weren't like, Oh, this is such a barbaric thing. I would never want my kids to be in it. But then as you know, it evolves more and I realize, Oh, you know, it's an art. You got to remember that that word's in there. So <laughs> it's really right. not about it being, you know, just a savage. I mean, obviously there's those people out there and there's always going to be because it's fighting. Combat is always going to be, um, you know, a very primal thing. But at the same time, you know, it's a very disciplined, um, you know, it's an art really. So yeah, man, it, that's the cool thing about MMA. I think it's just, there's so many, just the progression of it has been so unique, I think to watch. And yeah, just the more and more that we see young, like literally children you know, getting into it and just continue to stick with it. It's going to be, you know, wild to see how good that they can be you know everyone thought sage was going to be so awesome and all but just wait i don't think you have an idea how crazy it's going to get <laughs> like there are kids who are developing their brains right now that are watching michelle perheira fight right now and they're like oh my god i could do that and like 10 times better than that <laughs> so that's a little crazy as well uh, in terms of hooker and felder one of the questions that, that i've gotten a lot is you know, was this the fight of the year so far in 2020? You know, where where would you rank Hooker and Felder in terms of fight of the year so far in 2020? Like, I don't think it's number one, but I think it's up there. Where do you have that one, Drake? Hmm. I got I'm really trying to think here about, you know, some of the fights that we've seen so far. Um, I mean, I if I can't think of one like right away, then this is probably, you know, right up there. Cause I thought, yeah, I thought it was very, very good. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, you know, glued, like I can't, I can't blink this. I can't look away at this one. Cause I might miss something. And that's how, you know, they were so active. What they, they landed almost the exact amount, like same strikes, the volume and the output was like all the same. It was like one sixteen to one nineteen or something crazy. Um, you know, I don't know. You never know if the stats are exact like that, but they were, you know, throwing a lot, obviously, if you watch the fight. Um, I mean, yeah, man, that fight was really good. I, I, I blank, you know, on, you know, that possible other contenders, you know, Jones Reyes was really good too. Um, but I don't, I don't think it was as good as this one just cause it was so, it was just an intense fight. I think even the atmosphere of this one being in hooker's backyard, his first main event, just the elements of this one were a lot more. It was just a really intense feeling fight. And, you know, and you see Paul Felder get booed, you're like, and he's so intense coming out, man. I, I think it just all lined up perfectly. And, you know, I tweeted this out too, that, I thought the whole, just the whole entire scene of that main event from the walkout, from the walkouts to like the end, the the post-fight interviews, man, that was MMA at its absolute purest, man. Because you see all, every single, we saw every single emotion that we could possibly see you know, in that main event. It was so crazy. You know, Felder, uh, you know, contemplating retirement, which he talked about a little bit after the Barboza fight, just if he didn't win, um, just like he's been thinking about it. And so you just see all that just the emotion coming out of everybody, you know, hooker gets that big win and he calls out Justin Gagey after a fight like that. I'm like, are you, he's insane. He's literally insane, man. So, uh, if, when I look at the whole entire picture, yeah, man, that's the fight of the year so far for me, but, um, I don't want to say that definitively because, you know, I feel like I am forgetting something. Maybe you got something in mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, just to be safe, 
I'll, I'll th- it's top four or five for sure. I mean, there's yeah, been some pretty yeah. good fights. Like Jones, Re- Jones Reyes is probably number one for me because people are still talking about that fight and there was so much yeah. on the line. And could you know, is Dominic Reyes did did he actually do the unthinkable and and beat John Jones? And a lot of people think he did and still think that number two. Mm-hmm. I, Sadiq Youssef and Andre Feely was a great fight. I'm going to throw that in there. Yeah. I thought Brett Johns and, and Tony Gravely was a great fight. Um, and then Hooker and Felder's right in that mix. Mm-hmm. So I'd say top three or four. But, I mean, tomorrow that could all change. So. Yeah. And this we is only know. UFC we're talking about, too. <laughs> I know, right? I know. We're not even diving into that. Other. So you wait till Ryzen starts throwing these cards out there. Oh, Good yeah. That's going to be an interesting year in MMA. Um, I want to pull this up real quick. Um Oh, this is an interesting question. Mm. So Tim writes, okay, if you were given the money to start a brand new MMA site and you could hire five people to work with you outside of Helwani and Akamoto, who would you put on your team, Drake? Well, that is a very good question. Five people. Five people that I would put on my team. See, this is a kind of an interesting one because, you know, I feel bad leaving certain people out. But Right. I'm I wish gonna... you could get, we could pick 12 <laughs> or like 15. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see here, though. I'm going to give this a good answer. So I have to pick James, James Lynch, of course. Um, then I think I would pick John Yunko. Th- these are all kind of biased, you know, because these are like guys who I'm more close with and everything. But at the same time, they're very good at what they do. John, you get that international flavor. Very good with the agency. And I... I, I with, for my side, I would want to cover absolutely everything I can. So you got James, who is pretty much a you know, Swiss Army knife at this point. Good with the regional guys. Uh, so then John, you know, Asian fighters, he does pretty much everybody too. Um, and this isn't including ourselves, right? Because, you know, I'd have to be on the team. Um, hmm. Well, of course, you, Mike. I have to say each other, right? No. <laughs> so there's, the, there's the three there. Um, and then let's see the final two. Um uh, maybe Sean Al Shadi, a uh, very good writer. Um, and that Travis Fold story, absolutely insane. Just phenomenal yeah. work there. Um, check that out if you haven't. So that's four people now. Fifth one, uh, let's see, probably Aaron Bronstetter. I'll, I'll take Bronstetter on there just because you know, all over the place, he's he's one of the best, obviously. Um, yeah, it's that's hard to pick, you know, just off the top of my head, though. I think that's a pretty solid team. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a great team. Um, this is like great. I wish you could pick like fifteen people. Um, yeah, right. uh, Nolan's my number one pick. I mean, he's my number one pick. Like, how can he not mm-hmm. be? Between the long form features he does, the the connections he has, the you know tenacity he has, the way he breaks fights. I mean, that guy just rose through the ranks real quick. Um, yeah, and he's yeah. just getting started. He's like 24 years old. I mean, this guy's got a long future ahead of him. I think he's one of those yeah, guys. Me too. That, so compare both of us. He's killing it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, honestly, like I, I think Jose Young's is super underrated. Like, and mm. and you need social media in this game. And I think he's one of the best at handling social media stuff. James Lynch is on my team. And Drake, yes, you would be on my team as well. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. <laughs> Thanks, I would say it anyways. Um, I love JHK too and El Shadi and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, what, just to mix it up, like I want to, I want to add a female element to the mix. Mm-hmm. So with that, I want give me Kristen King. Like I think, mm. I think she's going to be a mover and a shaker in the sport in the next couple of years. So for me, I'm going to strike before the iron is scorching hot with her. But I mean, shit, there's so many talented people out there. There's a lot of people out there that that a lot of people don't know of yet, and it's kind of unfortunate, but. Yeah. Five is such a tough number to pick and, you know, kind of like the way we sort of rank the fights of 2020 that could change tomorrow. I could watch an interview tomorrow and be like, Nope, you're out. And this person's in. Yeah, but exactly. Off, off the cuff. Ha ha. Uh, that, that's what I'm going with here, but I apologize. Anybody else. This is not a, this is definitely not a, a slap in the face to anybody. Cause there's so exactly. many good people up there. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of like UFC Norfolk questions for the, like, how things are lined. So mm-hmm. let me just pull these up. I think it's an appropriate time for the return of the lined, right, not right segment that we did a few weeks back. And I don't know if we were live oh, when yeah. we did that. We may have been, but I don't think so. No, um, no we weren't live for that one, yeah. but there were a couple of fights that were asked about specifically and, and I'm still blurry face for some reason, but uh, I'm going to go off of odd shark f- for this. So first off Drake, I mean, we got to talk about the main event the definitely the most intrigued, definitely the selling point of this whole card, Joseph Benavides and Davis and Figueredo for the vacant UFC flyweight title. Currently 
Joseph Benavides is the minus 140 favorite. Figueredo is a slight dog at plus 110. Do you think this is line right or or not right? That sounds, yeah, pretty perfect to me. I mean, you look at Benavidez's body of work. For my money, the most underrated fighter of all time, hands down, pretty easily. I'd probably put maybe, you know, Rafael Asuncao up there too. Uh, you know, a couple of these guys. But either way, Benavidez, one of the most underrated ever. He's only lost to three people, arguably two. I mean, the Pettis fight was really close. Obviously, had a rough first round, but rallied back really strongly. And then he's all, he's lost to two goats in Dominic Cruz and Demetrius Johnson. So no shame in those. Then he's beat everybody else, literally everybody else. The guy... He's he's just one of the most underrated ever. I, just, I don't think there's any debate about it. Um, he's seen it all. He's what he's had. He's over, over 30 fights now. The experience, just everything in his favor. Still one of the top guys hanging in there, not looking like he's slowing down, really. Even tore his ACL, came back just fine. Uh, that's when he had the Pettis loss and all that. Uh, and, but obviously, Figueredo is really a unique uh, uh, flyweight who's got just incredible finishing power, whether it's knockout or submission, obviously more knockouts than submissions, only three decisions out of 18 fights. Um, well, four decisions, if you count the loss three in his wins. So, I mean, man, it's going to be super good. I think the five rounds might actually, uh, you know, favor Figueredo a little bit just because he has more time to, you know, land something or get a finish, but we don't know how he'll do in the late rounds. We've seen Benavides can go all day. Uh, so yeah, I think that's pretty perfect just because, Keep it close because Figueredo more likely to get a finish, even though Benavides has shown he can finish too plenty of times, um, but not as much of a finisher, more of a well-rounded kind of guy. Um, not to say Figueredo isn't. It's close. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. The experience, though, goes in Benavides' favor. So that's kind of why I think that you have to put him as you know the guy. Just when you look at his body of work, there's just more to it. So, yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, I think it's pretty much where it needs to be. Like, I, I, I would maybe shift it like 10 points for each guy, like make – Maybe Benavidez minus one fifty plus one twenty, but I mean it's pretty mm-hmm. much line right. I'm not going to complain about yeah. it. It's it's pretty much rare. I can't wait for that fight. It's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one I've heard a lot about, um, even from like my little brother who just watches the fights strictly from a gambling perspective because he's kind of a degenerate <laughs> in that way. Uh, Megan <laughs> Anderson is fighting Norma Dumont, who is making her debut uh, in the UFC. She's four and zero from Brazil. Hasn't competed in a fight in well over a year now. So right now, Megan Anderson is a minus two forty favorite, and Dumont is a plus one ninety dog. What do you think on this one? Um, probably a little bit low. Honestly, I think I'd probably have Megan as a bigger favorite just because. Uh, I watched Craig's breakdown earlier today, so I got this nugget from him. <laughs> Shout out to Craig, who's not here, so I'm helping you out, buddy. <laughs> um, he said that Norma is, you know, usually fought at bantamweight. I haven't looked into this, so I'm taking his word completely. Is generally at bantamweight. I don't know if she's fought at featherweight before, but either way, smaller than Megan. You know, a lot of people are smaller than Megan. Not that that is a, you know, a massive thing. We've seen, you know, Megan obviously had the loss to Holly, who's smaller. Um, but yeah, and then the the year off of it, uh, in, the inactivity that she's had. Um, and then, you know, Megan looking good on the ground in her last fight, showing that, you know, there's more to her than just being a striker. And then when, as a striker, you know, she's one of the most powerful hitters in the division, um, and can put you out at any moment. So, yeah, I think that this is, uh, going to be a tough one for normal, but you know, you never know in MMA, but yeah, it, it's like, it's really hard to pick against her here with just what we know. Cause we know much more about her. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised it's not bigger. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I don't know where this thing opened. I can't really find it, but uh, yeah, I thought Megan would be in the in the minus 300 range yeah. or a little bit mm-hmm. higher than that. But you know, the inactivity. I mean, it's hot. Like, it's not easy. People. I mean, people throw out octagon jitters. It's kind of a cliche thing, but it's it's a real thing, especially if this is your fifth professional fight. Like, you've never fought in the United States before. Like, and now you're you're doing it in the UFC against Megan Anderson, who's looked great. I. I I think her mentality is is super on point right now. I think this is a steal at minus two forty. For being honest, like normally, mm-hmm. you know, you wouldn't touch a line that high with someone who's flip flop wins and losses through four fights in the UFC. But I feel like I feel like Megan wins this one rather easily. But we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, last one we're gonna take a look at Magomed Ankalaev is a minus two ten favorite over Eon Kutalaba. Comeback on Eon is uh, plus one sixty. Line right or not right? Okay, what is it again? Sorry about that. Uh, minus two ten for Ankalaev and plus one sixty for Kutalaba. I think that's that's probably fine. I I mean Kutalaba. I think that he's he's kind of been unreliable in my opinion. You know, there was the point where he was 
uh, there was a cannoneer fight, um, you know, where he was looking good. Uh, my memory might be a little off on him, but it feels like, you know, it's been hot and cold. There was the Khalil Roundtree one, which I think people were so high on Khalil after, you know, his recent performances moving to, you know, really work on his tie, uh, his Muay Thai and everything. Um, and then he goes out and, you know, uh, Kutilab goes out and finishes him impressively. So it's like hard to trust him. And I think with Ankalaev, we've seen more consistency. So I think he's got to be favored. It seems a bit more well-rounded to me. He can take the fight to the ground. Um, and, you know, obviously he's no no joke on the feet either as he got that uh, front kick. I, I might be mixing up the Russians here, but I'm pretty sure he was the one who got the front <laughs> kick. He might not be, actually. That might have been a middleweight. <laughs> so either way, um, Ankalaev very well-rounded, though. And he's legit. I just think we've seen more consistency from him. Uh, in multiple areas of his game. Obviously, Kutalaba, very powerful, light, heavyweight, and aggressive. Uh, just has that in-your-face kind of attitude. So, yeah, I mean, I think this sounds about right. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's lined right. Um, this fight, to me, kind of reminds me of Lauren Murphy versus Andrea Lee because mm. I'm, not a, I'm not a gambler. I don't bet on fights, but if I were... Th- if I were to throw dog money on anybody on this card at these prices, I'd probably throw it on Kudalaba because he is such a wild man. Yeah. And the price is just right. But at the end of the day, the the real winner, the, the winners are going to be us because I think this is going to be such a banger. I think those two guys are just going to shit out of each other. <laughs> we, mm-hmm. And that, that yeah. friend Cole Shelton has chimed in. Uh, thank you, Cole. What does the union assuming she and Felicia win as Felicia would most likely be getting that title shot at 145 as Nunes has made it known. She wants to defend that title next. So, I mean, it kind of seems that way. Felicia Spencer, since she has the win over Megan Anderson would probably have carte blanche, so to speak in getting that title shot against man and news. But honestly, I think Megan Anderson's a bigger name. I think she has a bigger following right now. I think it depends on the performance. What do you think? Like, do you think, let's just say, Let's say Felicia Spencer goes out and gets a, you know, 30, 27 unanimous decision across the board, but Megan Anderson flatlines Norman Dumont in the first 90 seconds of the fight. How do you, how, how do we go about this in terms of fighting Amanda Nunes next? Yeah, I, I think what you said is pretty a realistic possibility go off the performance and whatnot. But honestly, I think that if they both win, we're going to get an interim title fight. I know that sounds insane. I know that that sounds very, very crazy in a division of six, or five and a half people because Leo Letson's kind of in the middle. Well, I guess five. We can take away Nunez is kind of half and half too, I would say. Either way, yeah, that's a crazy thought, but hear me out. Okay? There's three and a half women's featherweights in yeah, the UFC it, right now. There's not many. That's the point. So I think that we will see an interim title fight between them two rematch. You could sell a rematch. They can put it as a, maybe not a headliner, but a co main event. And then let, here's the thing you have Nunez fight Aldana in the meantime, right? Uh, doesn't matter win or lose there then she still has the featherweight title but if she loses i'm sure they do the instant rematch with eldana that would obviously make sense but assume that nunez wins that then in the meantime you get an interim champion at featherweight if if somebody has a title there a lot easier to sell for them you know they love having belts on people to you know make the fight bigger i don't know if they you know trust the this because we've seen Nunez, not a great draw like you look back at the penning to fight what was at the lowest ever in the modern era so it's like do they have much to gain from a business standpoint by putting Nunes against somebody who isn't super popular um, in between Megan and Felicia? Yeah, Megan is the bigger name, I think. But, you know, when it comes to how big somebody can be, is she big enough for them to feel comfortable putting her in a title fight without uh, another additional selling point, which would be a gold belt, whether interim or not, you know, silly as it would be they like they could be like oh champion versus champion kind of thing you know so i think that business wise that is the most realistic thing obviously if you're not going to do that then you have performance but i mean at the same time it's like do they do they really care if nunez goes back and fights it you know featherweight they're just letting her hold on to the title now she hasn't defended it since winning it in 2018 at the end of 2018 so that's what I think is going to happen, but we'll see. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're probably right. I think if we're making odds, I think you're lined right here. Um, man, this is honestly, here's, here's what I think. I am not a proponent of three title fights on a card. Like I, I understand mm-hmm. the, the pizzazz and the salesmanship of it all. I get it. If Megan Anderson goes out there and just crushes Norma Dumont and has that, you know, that ESPN MMA Twitter account, you know, little headliner there and it gets like a couple million views, which, which it might, you know, 
I would not hate throwing Amanda Nunes in a Megan Anderson fight on that Perth card. I mean, if you're mm-hmm. going to throw a third title fight on any, if it's from any division, women's featherweight is the perfect one to do. Because yeah. let's just think about it this way. Like you're looking at July, August. I mean, we're already, these cards are filling up anyways. I mean, international fight week, like, yeah, maybe you could throw that on there, but if you're going to throw Conor McGregor on there, it doesn't really matter. Like Conor's the draw itself. You can just put anything you want on there. I mean, John Jones wants to stay active. Uh, there's just so many things you can do. So I don't think it's, I, I think you could do that if you really wanted to, but I mean, I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but I wouldn't hate that idea. Uh, yeah. But I think let's, that let, you, you got to get me. Yeah. I mean, that and, and let's kind of remember, <laughs> and let's also kind of remember like the rankings, they don't mean shit. What have you, what have you done for me lately? It doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. We got Yo Romero fighting for a title. We got Jose Aldo fighting for a title. Both these guys have lost back to back fights. They care about money and business and draws. That's what it's all about. And just look at the social media numbers. Megan Anderson is, is a bigger name than Felicia Spencer is. Felicia Spencer has the win. Felicia Spencer is probably a better fighter overall, probably a more well rounded martial artist, but Megan Anderson's the bigger draw, especially on a card like that. That place, Perth will just be massive and the building will be electric. So, but we'll see what happens. That's a good question, Cole. That's a, that's another podcast for another, for another day as well. <laughs> uh, if you guys get questions, throw them in there. Uh, we're going to jump into the buy sell segment here. Got the email up here. We'll probably get to four or five of these. And if you guys want to throw some questions, I will do that as well. Uh, first one, uh, here we go. Buy or sell Drake Riggs that if a fighter misses weight, not only should they lose a percentage of their purse, but they should be deducted points for the fight itself. I see this idea thrown around, thrown around a lot, Drake. What say you? You buying this or selling this? I yeah, I love that idea. You know, um, I've seen the the question of whether or not they should be deducted as many points as pounds they would they missed, which is a kind of maybe a little extreme. But uh, yeah, if you take away maybe a point per round or something like that, at least one point, you know, then it kind of creates that incentive of, all right, man, it's harder for them to win because it, it's, it's just not fair. You know, when you see somebody come in overweight and then, you know, still go on and win the fight, you know, maybe it would have happened either way, but come on, you know, that's, this is the whole point is to, to have the sportsmanship and, you know, do what your opponents do and make everything fair as you can. So yeah, I'm, I'm for that idea. I think that, you know, probably the biggest thing, um, I, I buy this idea, but the biggest thing that I would try to, you know, uh, start in terms of making sure people don't miss weight more, even though it doesn't happen too much these days, it seems like, uh, is, you know, take away more money because nobody wants to lose money. Uh, if you up it to like half the purse or, you know, maybe even get a little crazy, go to 70%, you know, something where it's like, Hey, you really don't want to miss weight if you're having that much of a you know risk at, of losing that much. Um, I think that's probably the most, the best way to do it, but also kind of very controversial. <laughs> but, um, I'm buying the idea. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to see what those tweets would look like. Oh, you missed weight. Oh, but she agreed to conti- She agreed to fight as long as she takes seventy percent of her purse. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh man, that'd be hilarious. I, I guess I'll buy it. Like. I agree with you with the, it creates better discipline. It creates safer weight cuts, you know, maybe keeps guys and gals their natural weight more than we see now. I guess we'll buy that one. But man, I, now that you said it, I'm, I'm in on this 70% <laughs> discrepancy. <laughs> that would be a lot. I mean, I feel bad for the fighters, but man, would that be yeah. a lot of fun? It's a lot of good little news items. Our good friend JHK is chiming in. Megan versus Amanda would be a bloodbath. Perth is a perfect place to dump a body from, from what I heard. JHK's ears must be ringing because we just brought his name up a little while while ago yeah. uh, cole has another question as i said on btl yesterday this is a good buy sell question drake buy or sell mm-hmm. that this is the worst ufc card in recent memory um man um here let me let's look at it here there's still a tbd on this one according to wikipedia <laughs> um it was TBD? Worst one? Uh, against giga chikadze at featherweight it says he doesn't have an opponent here is this something we missed <laughs> I guess uh, <laughs> maybe. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Uh, let's see. I mean, we got Nardiev here opening the card, which is kind of crazy. Uh, Tybura versus Spivak. Luis Pena, Steve Garcia. That's Steve Garcia is coming in late. Um, uh, for me, no. I I was really didn't feel anything for that Rio Rancho card too much. Like, I mean, 
you look at a main event too and compare main events there, man, this one's going to be super good. And, you know, as somebody who's, um, you know, very into, you know, just the women's scene and trying to, you know, give them as much exposure as possible. Cause you know, I think that they don't give enough exposure in my opinion all the time. So, you know, I'm very, you know, into, you know, these featherweight fights. Um, I don't think it's the worst, but I do. I thought that um, Cole's comment was very funny. It's a card. <laughs> that, needs, that needs to be a quote somewhere. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm selling that one. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. It's it's what you would expect for you know a week before a pay per view in Norfolk, Virginia. You're not bringing an A plus ball game to ESPN Plus. You're just not. But, but this is a this is a prospect showcase kind of a card. You get guys like. Yeah, uh, Nardiev and Brady, uh, Alan, Alan Cruz, Spike Carlisle, both guys making their debuts. TJ Brown's making his debut against Jordan Griffin. Jordan Griffin's probably fighting for his job. Brendan Allen's on this card. Uh, Kyler Phillips, Gabriel Silva. You got Luis Pena. Grant Dawson's on this card, uh, fighting a just a wily veteran and, and Derek Minner. Thirty-four fights, um, and then you get some violence up the top with Kutalab and Ankalaev. I don't think it's a terrible card. I mean, obviously, star power wise and rankings wise, it's not great. As Cole said, there's only two ranked fighters on the card, and they're both fighting in the main event. Um, but yeah, that, I, I don't. Yeah. I, I think it's gonna be a fun card to watch. I think it's gonna surprise a lot of people. I will say though that I think that the UFC cards so far in 2020 that we've gotten, they've been pretty like. They haven't been that great on paper, you know, like overall, there hasn't been one that's like where everyone's like, oh, man, this one's stacked. Can't wait for it. I guess maybe people would say the best one so far is 248 from, you know, if we look at it and that one's coming up here. But uh, I haven't been like super dying to see like a full card this year so far. Like, obviously, there have been some good fights here and there, but they haven't really given us like anything huge yet. You know, obviously, we will end up getting that where it's just like loaded top to bottom. But um, I don't know if that's normal. I'd have to go back and like look at past schedules, but it's just something I noticed. Am I off here? <laughs> yeah, it's it's just been weird. I'll never forget one of my favorite moments of 2020 was was Craig Allen running down the Rio Rancho card from from start to finish. <laughs> that, was that was that was tremendous <laughs> stuff. Uh, question for Drake: Drake is orange the new black? Well, you know, man, <laughs> it is actually. You know, from this JJ. is usually the shirt that I wear when I go running. And so if it's the one that I prefer, I guess it is. Cause it it's fitting and you know, people can see me. So I don't get ran over by cars, man. <laughs> That's right. It's running is a dangerous game, man. Exactly. <laughs> um, let me see what else we got here. Oh, buy or sell that Angela Hill will be at worst in line for a number one contender fight at one fifteen by the end of the year. There's a lot of love these days, Drake for Angela Hill picked up another nice win on Saturday on short notice. There's three wins in a row for Angela Hill and Drake. I know you hate to hear this, but there's some folks out there that thought she beat your favorite fighter at UFC 238. What do you think of Angela Hill's, you know, potential title prospects as, as you roll your eyes at that comment? Well, as you brought it up, and Craig isn't here. I did bring props today, so I got my my Chinese warrior mask that I made <laughs> in China in Shanghai in honor of Yan Jianan. <laughs> so I had to bring that out there. Hot take mask. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Hot take mask. <laughs> um, you know, Angela Hill obviously improving a lot. She looks has looked phenomenal in these last couple fights here. Um, but yeah, I'm going to sell that one, man. I think straw is just far too deep. There are some girls who are just stylistic nightmares for her. I think maybe not nightmares, but they're always going to be tough ones for her. Um, she's obviously improving a lot, but I don't know. Also, if the super active fighter, you know, if that's the best ingredient to uh, reach, you know, the highest of highs, you know, we've only really seen it with Cowboy and, you know, everyone else who's tried to be so active hasn't, uh, you know, reached the same level that he has and he never even became champion and you know most likely won't at this point um and even on angela's what her six fights in a year span she's you know lost some it's not like she went on a six fight winning streak like you know cerrone was able to and in what he's only did five or whatever but you know that's what i'm getting at um i think she could maybe get close but man straw weight is just so good right now the, the fighters are really it's a it's such a deep top 10 uh 15 even i don't even have her in the rankings even after her success um that's how good it is so i mean yeah that's that's going to be a hard sell for me maybe she can get there at some point in 2021 but i i still think that's going to be tough you know she's been really fun exciting to watch improving like i said but i just think there's too many other good people that's as simple as it is 
Yeah, I want to get crazy right now and, and and buy this, but I just can't. Like, I, I just, I, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. What a story that would be. I mean, there's, yeah. there seems to be one every year that, you know, comes from unranked or at the bottom of the division that, that shoots their way up to that point after running off some amazing wins. Um, I just don't know if it happens at straw weight. It's just, there's just too much talent there at, at this point. Nothing against she, Angela. I just think it's you a better a hope she doesn't run into down on again. <laughs> <laughs> I know Angela would probably want that rematch at this point. Yeah. Um, ooh, JHK with the buy or sell question. Buy or sell Drake Riggs. Korean zombie never fights for the title due to his body failing him. I'm going to sell that one. I think that Korean zombie is just too exciting. Uh, there will be too much desire for everybody to see that. I mean, we want to see that next. Most people seem to want to see that next over the Holloway rematch. I want to see it next over the Holloway rematch. Um, nothing against Holloway, but I mean, it's like, you know, come on, let's just, it, it's a weird spot for him. You know, that's a totally different topic, but um, yeah, man, Korean zombie. So love. He's so exciting. He's looking so good lately. Obviously the injuries are a problem, but, if he's out for who knows how long, I don't think it'll hurt him that too that much because uh, I mean, what, who else could you put over him aside from Holloway right now? You know, Ortega's coming off the loss. You could throw a beat at him, but that's obviously not the plans. A beat's going to fight somebody. Um, I, I believe on two forty nine, right. That's what I was hearing. Yeah, um, Ortega looks like the front runner for that one. That's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah, uh, maybe he'll get skipped over by somebody other than Holloway. It's kind of hard for me to imagine that happening, depending on how long he's out. I know John obviously knows a lot more about the situation than I do, and I have seen what he's been saying about it, but I didn't really, I don't remember the timetable necessarily, but I think we'll see him fight again for it, man. I mean, it's it's like, how can you not give Korean Zombie another title shot? That first one was so, you know, it left a lot to be desired. Yeah, I think I think his next fight's gonna be for the belt. Like I, I think they're I, I think Holloway was sort of the plan all along. Like I, I just think that was gonna be it. I, I feel like Dana wanted to run that one back no matter what, just because Max Holloway's been, you know, such a company guy for a long time. I know he hasn't didn't have like a ton of title defenses and he wasn't like a, a five year running champion or anything like that, but you know, Max has sort of become the face of that division over the years and he lost to Volkanovsky mm-hmm. and for some reasons people think still think that fight was close. I don't think that fight was close that Volkanovsky dominated no. that fight. Uh but you know run it back g- give Volkanovsky his moment if not, you know Holloway gets a big moment as well and then you can run back uh, run it back a third time perhaps, but uh if Volkanovsky wins, I, t- Korean Zombie has to be the next guy. I don't think he rushes a beat into a title fight at this point. Um I don't think Ortega is quite there yet. I think featherweight's very interesting division right now. I think there's a there's a lot of good talent at, at 45 right now. We still got guys like Cater that's on the rise, who's getting ready to fight Jeremy Stevens, which I think is the absolute perfect Ooh. fight uh, for him. So that's great. And then we get some other guys in in, in the mix as well. We got the Ryan Halls Emmett of the there. world, Shane Ryan Burgos. Halls. We got Josh Emmett. We got a lot of other guys. Uh, so featherweight's really interesting right now. But I still think Korean mm-hmm. Zombie's going to get a get a title fight whenever whenever he's ready to go sometime in 2020. Uh, I think we'll do one more buy sell and then we'll see if there's any other questions. Uh, buy or sell that the hype surrounding the fallout of Wilder versus Fury 2 is overrated. The card wasn't all that great. The title fight wasn't all that competitive. What do you think? So I assume maybe Sam, like maybe uh, he might've heard John Anik say this on Anik and Florian. Anik said he'll take a UFC pay-per-view over that card. And he the week. He feels like all of the, the hype surrounding it was completely overrated. It was not what it, what it, what it, you know, it's being portrayed on social media and other outlets as well. Did you watch it? I'm, I'm sure you did being a combat sports fan, but what did you think of Wilder Fury and this notion that it's all overrated? Well, Mike, I'm honestly, I have zero interest in boxing, so I did not watch the fight. I saw the finish, but I, I just really am – I don't have any interest in boxing, man. I I always think about like, oh, man, he could take him down right here. He should throw a head kick and that kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've obviously – I'm that guy. I'm so MMA, in love with MMA that it just does nothing for me. Like I I think the last boxing match I watched was uh, Klitschko and Anthony Joshua, which everyone thought was like pretty amazing and all that, right? I was like, yeah, it was okay. You know, it's, it's just the, they're throwing hands only. It's like, it doesn't do anything for me, man. So I didn't watch it. Um, I, I was a, I was a little interested though. And in my, I actually had you no know, casual friends like hitting me up about it and like, Oh, we got to see this one. And you know, after, um, you know, I didn't see the first fight either, but the crazy, obviously you've seen that crazy knockdown where Tyson Fury resurrects himself from the dead. I mean, I think, you know, this is a, 
take my opinion for what it is since I am not a boxing fan whatsoever. It seemed justified to me. It seemed like a huge thing. I know that they're in the big three of the best heavyweights, right? Them with Joshua, um, even though he lost to Ruiz, but got the Ruiz win back. So, I mean, it's it seemed like a reasonable you know amount of hype for such a big deal because these are the consensus three guys, right? Like you tell me. But, um, yeah, I, I mean – especially with what happened in that fight and it being a draw and just super dramatic seeming. Um, I, I don't know, just from, from what I have seen and saw seemed, seemed fine to me, but I'm not, you know, in the boxing world. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll sell that notion, but I, I, I guess I understand why people would think that way. Like, and I'm totally fine with, with Wilder invoking his rematch. And I think it's a, I do think it's a far more competitive fight than, than a fight with Anthony Joshua would be, but and listen, you can complain about the the third fight all you want, but you're going to watch it. Drake may not watch it, but I think nope. a lot of other people will. <laughs> uh, so who gives a shit? Run it back. And, you know, he had in his contract that he can invoke a rematch clause. And I think anybody else in, in his shoes would, would invoke that rematch clause as well. Like, just get it out. And and if it's a fluke, if the costume was too heavy for you, then I was waiting for it. Costume was time. For, for God's sakes, that is the craziest uh, excuse I've ever heard in my geez. entire life. And maybe, you know, maybe there's some truth to it. I'm not Deontay Wilder. I'm not, I'm not here to judge, but that is, I, I out of all the things I thought I would hear, I didn't okay. think I'd hear. Can, can I, can we talk about that for just a brief second? For just a brief second. You, you're telling me that he didn't know or realize that it was like that heavy or, much of a nuisance before the fight. Do you not try it on before, man? Like, I don't know. It seems Stephen so... A. Stephen A. said today on first take that he did try it on the day before. Like, come on, man. <laughs> for, okay, first of all, as as cool as I'm all for giving fighters unique entrances and all that. I love the rise in entrances, you know. Bellator, I think those are fine, too. You know, give them a little more uniqueness to what they can go out there. But, man, boxers, sometimes they just go so overboard. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous to me. Um I mean, maybe that's a little hypocritical to say, but I don't care, man. It's it's silly. <laughs> see, Fury did it right because he sat down and let women carry him yeah, so there on you a go. throne. <laughs> I mean, not just saying because women carried him. I'm saying that he just sat there yeah. and got carried to the ring. Like, that's what everybody <laughs> should be doing. It should be like WrestleMania 3 when you're yes. sitting in the ring and just you're carted to the ring. That little like, ring, you should, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <so you're, laughs> You know what I'm talking about with the federettes, with the federettes yes. undoing the ropes. Like that's what, that's what they all should be doing. That's what they all should be doing. I have to ask this question. This this isn't a buy sell question, okay. but I think this question is absolutely phenomenal. Now that Henry Cejudo and Jose Aldo is booked, if you were to make a four man tournament to decide who would take on the winner of that fight with all the available contenders right now, so not everyone's going to make this four pe- this four man tournament, Drake. Mm-hmm. How are you matching these guys up? Hmm. So do I get to pick the contenders or do I have to go by the actual top four? You pick the contenders. This is, okay. this is your show, bro. Okay, this is my show. Let's see. So obviously, Jan and Sterling are in there. And then, then Sandhagen and wildcard Dominic Cruz. I do want Dominic Cruz in there. I think he deserves um, deserved you know, an instant rematch after that loss. But obviously... Can't do that anymore if we're going by a perfectly logical world, but I would want him in there. Um, and then how I would match those four. Let's see. I would like to do, hmm, I might say Jan versus Sandhagen and then Sterling against Cruz. I mean, man, you can't go wrong with any of those matchups, dude. Bantamweight is so goddamn good. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's that's what I would probably go with. <laughs> Here's what I would do, and maybe this is this is wrong on my part, but you know, maybe we do like the NCAA tournament where you have like two legit guys that are in there. So maybe since Marias is, I think Marias uh, is is the top seed, right? Oh no, he's not. No, he is. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. the number one content. He's the number one ranked guy, right? Mm-hmm. So what you do is you match up Jan and Sterling, but then you have a a fight in fight between uh, Cruz and Marias. Like, I want to see that fight anyways, yeah. so maybe selfishly I just want to see that. And then the winner gets Mario Marias and gets into the tournament. I know it would take a little bit longer, but who gives a shit, really? <laughs> I mean, I want to see all of these fights. I want to see know. all of these guys fight each other. So that's how I would do it. Uh, but, I mean, we don't even know when Cruz is coming back, but I have to see Cruz and Marias at some point in my yeah. life. See, John's suggestion here, Jan and Sterling, Marias, Sanhagen, I think that's the most logical way to go about that. But, um, yeah, Dominic, you know, wants to come back within these six months. I'm hoping so much <laughs> that he does. I know. Um, 
but yeah, you you can't go wrong with mixing and matching those. And uh, just think about then you get the winners against each other. Love it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, and, you know, and Frankie Edgar's chilling out there too. So he might even be in consideration as well. So I don't know if I'd shit. put him in the tournament, but yeah, he could be an alternate maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my tournament, he's not in, but in the UFC's tournament, he may very yeah, well be. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, so there we go. I'm looking through and I think we're, I think we're done here. 45 minutes, just the two of us. Who needs Kyle and Craig? Mm -hmm. Craig can go play hockey for the rest of 2020 for all I care. (laughs) Uh, And that's that. So, Drake, appreciate you jumping on here, man. This is your suggestion to go live at the last minute. I'm happy to do so. It makes my life a little bit easier. Uh, Anything else you want to let the folks know about? Cruz versus Sandhagen is the best matchup. That's a fun fight, too. Love to see that. I think we will see that at some point. Uh, thanks to JHK and Cole Shelton for being the only two people watching the show and commenting. Yeah. Appreciate that. That's what happens when you do the shit last minute. But uh, anything you got coming up? Anything you want to plug, my friend? Uh, let's see. Just some interviews this week. Um, you know, keep them secret. Oh, well, I actually have some I did last week. Uh, I talked to Randa Marcos before she takes on Amanda Heba. Said UFC Brasilia, so that'll be coming out. I think I'm going to try and get it next week because the uh, two weeks from now or whatever. And then I have a secret one, which is uh it's gonna be very i'm excited to see what people think of it because it's very unique you'll never guess who it is that i talked to literally go ahead try you're gonna be wrong it's that kind of thing uh very unique look forward to sharing that um and yeah just some things i got lined up for the rest of the week that will be out whenever they're out but um look for that random marcos one on the scrap when it comes out uh yeah that's that's all for now i think so this mystery interview, it's like the Gavin DeGraw singing the national anthem at, at Wilder exactly. Fury 2. You gave me a thousand guesses on who was going to sing that. <laughs> Gavin DeGraw would not be one of my thousand guesses. Uh, yeah, just follow me on YouTube. Uh, Mike, just go to youtube.com forward slash Mike Heck MMA. I uh, had a great interview with Gerald Mearshart today. I've never heard him so fired up in my life. He had a lot of not so nice things to say about Deron Wynn, who he's fighting next Saturday at UFC 247. Uh, so look out for that. He had a really good interview with with Gilbert Burns today. I'm really excited to release that. I'll, I'll edit that and put that up there tomorrow morning. I know JHK had a great interview with him as well. Um, we dove into a lot of different things. The, they told the whole story about how this Maya fight came to be and how he didn't feel like it was going to happen. And all of a sudden it did. And he was like a little kid. It was amazing just to see him light up and reminisce about when he found out he actually got the yes that he was going to fight Damian Maya. So uh, really good stuff there. And I got a bunch of other interviews with prospects and UFC fighters and bellator fighters guys who won over the weekend so forth and so on so be sure to subscribe to that follow our twitters you see them right here on the bottom of the screen for drake griggs i am mike heck we will see you no need to be scripted it's better to go off the cuff i'm gonna throw that out there anytime just because it's cheesy as hell and it's hilarious thank you guys (laughs) for watching and make sure you subscribe here on the network and on wherever you listen to your favorite podcast apple podcasts it's your soundcloud etc thank you very much see you later 